I traveled to the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Since 1990, people from Asian countries have been the state's largest immigrant group. I actually am a very, very proud American. I believe in this country. I believe in the promise that it has. I am grateful that my grandparents and their ancestors were able to come to the United States and allow me to, to be where I am to, to research American history and, and yes, indeed, to criticize its policies. Not in every country is that possible. Um, but I think it is because of that love of country and belief in its abilities that this really dark history, as well as the realization that this is such a strong tradition, was not only a, um, a big reckoning. I mean, I, you know, as a historian, I've, I've often written, most of my work has sought to reveal these forgotten or darker chapters of history. So it's, it's not like I was, you know, walking through um, this scholarship with, with rose-colored glasses or that this is necessarily anything new to me, but the depth of it and also the realization that um, it has been so deeply embedded and that it won't be easily dismantled has been um, quite challenging um, at the same time that I understand the huge human toll that it takes on very real people. Erica is one of the nation's leading immigration and Asian American historians and a distinguished professor at the University of Minnesota. Together, they've experienced both uh, the limits and the possibilities of America. She's been named a 2018 Andrew Carnegie Fellow and is the author of several books, including The Making of Asian America, A History, and America for Americans, a history of xenophobia in the United States. When we put up the real wall, we're going to stop 99 percent, maybe more than that. Hardline immigration policies were a big part of U.S. President Donald Trump's platform when he ran for office. For example, he promised to build a wall along the U.S.-Mexican border. U.S. immigration policies, uh, obviously you had to get deep into that and, and it's gone all over the place mm -hmm. throughout the history. How does it shape up compared to other countries, would you say? Um, our immigration policies in terms of closing our doors and increasing enforcement and now immigration bans are also being echoed around the world. I think that they do, I think because the United States has such a um, historic position of leadership on immigration, both in terms of welcoming as well as these, you know, being the first country to establish federal bans and, and exclusions, it has a cachet that other countries, when they see what we're doing, it helps justify their policies. So there are similar bans and similar, um, certainly the rise of anti-immigrant nationalist parties, both in the United States and in Europe, for, for example, they're feeding off each other. It's part of a global, I, I think, um, a global xenophobia that is going to be much harder to curb because of the ways in which ideas and messages of hate spread so easily in today's media landscape. Erica's own family was subjected to the first ban in the United States of an entire ethnicity or nationality, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The act barred Chinese immigration to the United States and Chinese nationals already in the country were no longer eligible to become U.S. citizens. It wasn't until 1943 that the act was repealed. While it was still the law of the land, some Chinese took drastic measures to get into the country. Your story, in many respects, as you trace uh, the immigration story that your family went through. The Angel Island story I'm struck by because of what your grandfather went through. Uh, humiliating, degrading. Mm -hmm. Walk us through what happened. So this is the period of Chinese exclusion. I know it's really common for Americans and many others to think about the immigration policies that we're living under today in 2020 as something new. These immigration bans, they're very 
dramatic and, and far-reaching. But um, as students of American history know, the first group that was banned uh, from the United States were Chinese immigrants. Uh, these laws were put in place in 1882. They lasted until 1943. And they were in direct response to the global migration of Chinese, and not just going to the United States, but also Canada, Mexico, other places in Latin America, and especially Southeast Asia. There was a, a global rise of anti-Chinese sentiment. Uh, and the U.S. responded first by naming Chinese immigration as this, um, this invasion, a threat that could only, be, um, could only be solved with drastic response, and that was the Exclusion Act of 1882. The problem was, very similar to like many other trends in migration, the problem was that the United States still needed workers, it still needed laborers. It was explicitly recruiting uh, immigrants from, from other places in the world. And at the same time, any scholar or student of Chinese history knows that the 19th century is a period of immense chaos and civil and political and economic unrest. So Chinese are eager, uh, even desperate to leave, even if they know that they are going to have to come without authorization. So most of my family came in um, as exempt from the exclusion laws. They were merchants or merchant families, but one of my grandfathers was an orphan, a, a farmer, uh, would, would not have been able to enter the U.S. Uh, under the Exclusion Act and thus bought papers, false papers, took on the identity of someone else who was an admissible immigrant and then had to go through the interrogations and the examinations on Angel Island to prove that he was indeed that person. He passed that test, but only after a humiliating experience, medical exams, I think there were 200 questions that he had to answer as part of his interrogation, two weeks of detention at the immigration station on Angel Island, um, and then a, a lifetime of living in the shadows as an undocumented uh, immigrant. And had to pay for those papers too, didn't he? Absolutely. It was extraordinarily expensive, about $1,000 in 1917. Which is just unbelievable. Right. What this, if, when you put it in terms of how much that is today. Right. It's... My grandmother on my mother's side she, she had a very different story. She was left behind by her family, um, who came to the United States but decided to leave her behind and take her male cousin to the United States instead, so essentially giving up her slot, her chance at the United States to give to a male cousin. And that was personally devastating for her. Um, she never saw her, her mother again, and so there was this sort of compounding of, of tragedy for her, that there's the unfairness of the immigration laws, but then a sense of betrayal by her own family. When new arrivals first stepped foot into the U.S., they were subjected to thorough medical tests and examinations. The result of xenophobic fears, claiming immigrants carried diseases that could spread to Americans. The coronavirus pandemic has stoked such fears once again with claims that certain ethnic groups, specifically the Chinese, are responsible for the outbreak. But I'm a little upset with China, I'll be honest with you. U.S. President Trump has been accused of racism by his repeated use of calling COVID-19 a Chinese virus and a foreign virus, a criticism he dismisses. This cauldron of uh, xenophobia, uh, throat coronavirus in there. I mean, mm. what, what are the likely outcomes of that? So one of the persistent myths or charges about immigration has been immigrants don't assimilate, there are too, um, too many of them, they bring crime, they bring disease. So many of our policies have been focused in the past on um, trying to identify dangerous, um, contagious diseases, certainly, but also they've been used to target specific populations for exclusion when there was really very little danger of contagion. This is especially true with, with Asian immigrants and especially true with, with Chinese in particular. On Angel Island at the immigration station in the early, 19, early 1900s, immigration officials used, um, used parasitic diseases like 
fluke worm or hookworm, diseases that are easily curable with antibiotics, even then, as a means for exclusion. So if you tested for these parasitic diseases that were most common amongst um, people coming from um, uh, developing rural and tropical conditions, so like southern China in the early 20th century, you could be barred for exclusion. There weren't the similar types of, of diseases that um, were used to mask or weed out European immigrants, for example. With coronavirus, it's being seen as something that has is somehow sort of genetic or, or biological to, to Chinese people, to Chinese culture. Um, there seems to be a spread of, of racist uh, behavior and prejudice that is targeting all Chinese and Chinese looking people as carriers of this virus rather than through a more scientific lens in terms of how germs get passed um, through contact. And that's a troubling echo from some of the earlier rhetoric and policies of the past. So if you were to trace that forward to today, given the history that you know, what are your greatest concerns? I think they're already being realized. I, I know that the news media has found many, many instances of, of people um, in the United States, either Chinese international students or Chinese Americans, feeling like they are being targeted for um, for discriminatory treatment, that they are being shunned, that they are being seen as, as carriers of, of a virus, um, of this virus. And we also have seen reports of um, discriminatory actions, you know, no Chinese allowed in certain restaurants. Um, so this is, uh, I, I think, it's, it's, I fear that it will spread as the virus has spread. Um, and it's going to take not only a scientific response to curb the spread of the virus, but also a societal response so that prejudice doesn't also travel. Did you have any questions about what? Um, yeah, I have a couple, no question, but it's... Erica's work connects immigration policies to a history of prejudice. She also educates the public about immigrants' impact on society, both past and present. So it's so interesting, uh, your books, they kind of dovetail with the work at the research center. Right. Uh, talk to us about that research center, how it came to be, and how these two kind of intersect. Yeah, so I'm director of the Immigration History Research Center at the University of Minnesota, and it's uh, an institute that was formed in 1965. So the idea was that it was so important and necessary to preserve our immigration history, but that no one was really doing that. So my predecessors uh, reached out and started doing oral histories, started collecting documents and organizational papers. We have the largest immigrant um, archive in North America. And related to that, we conduct research and have public programming every year and help facilitate uh, academics and outreach on immigration history uh, locally and nationally. This administration probably is gonna give you several chapters, I would think. I think so. I mean, already beginning in 2016, we were very much um, wanting to respond to this new increased uh, public attention to immigration. So one of the projects that we started was um, our Immigrant Stories digital storytelling project. We wanted to sort of counter some of those narratives in American media about dangerous immigrants and help immigrants and refugees tell their own stories. Um, so we have a, a project that helps people do that and has about 350 stories um, in our archive. And then we also have another project that's called the Immigration Syllabus, which is um, a crowdsourced project, a crowdsourced educational resource that helps to provide historical context and um, resources on today's contemporary immigration debates. Both are free, both are online. Um, they're used around the country and also around the world. 
In the past four centuries, almost 7 million Germans have immigrated to the U.S., and 40 to 60 million Americans say their origin is German, making them the largest group of immigrants in the country. Reading this book, I start to think about my family mm. history. My, father, my father's side of the family came from Germany. You, you see in here, mm -hmm. Germans vilified, mm -hmm. called scum, mm -hmm. Irish Catholics, mm -hmm. uh, the Know Nothing Party, mm -hmm. targeting them. And yet, uh, it's not a part of my history. Mm -hmm. I, I, I never had the opportunity to talk about my grandparents, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure it would resonate as much, because one of the things you point out is, is this white America. At some point, you can kind of meld right. if you're German or you're, right. or, or you're Irish Catholic. Right. Not the case if you're Chinese right. American. Yes, that's absolutely true. So there, you know, no matter how many generations one is in the United States, there are still many times when I've been asked, where are you from? And if I say, I was, you know, grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, where, where are your parents from? They grew up in New York. Oh, you know, what about your grandparents? They also spent most of your, their lifetimes in New York, but they were born in China. Okay, so you're Chinese. Well, you know, <laughs> really we're American, but um, Chinese American. And let's talk about that because there are these coded questions, aren't they, which kind of try and mask racism, but it's right. out there. Absolutely. Um, there's the where are you from questions that tend to assume that because of how someone looks, they must be from a foreign country, American. And I think, unfortunately, especially under the current administration, American has, has come to be reinforced as, as white American. Um, and over the decades, certainly, it includes not only Protestant Americans, but Jewish and Catholic Americans. But during times of anxiety, as we can see, um, there's a rise of anti-Semitism again that many had thought was a chapter from the past that wouldn't, wouldn't return. One of the things I like uh, in your book is uh, how I think you, you kind of capture the sentiment of a lot of Americans in that this couldn't happen in a post-Obama world, that right. it's an aberration. But then you go on to say, and I want you to talk about this, xenophobia sells. Xenophobia has helped siphon working class resentment away from corporate greed and economic inequality. Xenophobia has helped American capitalism mm -hmm. thrive. Xenophobia has also driven the democratic process. Right. We don't think about all of these things coming together. Right. So talk about that. Yeah, the, the more that I researched the book, I understood first that xenophobia is an American tradition in and of itself. It's not um, it's not something that goes away when we feel confident. It's not something that goes away when our economy is good. It is, as you mentioned, it's sort of at the underbelly of American society. It's this undercurrent. But it's not, it, it wasn't enough for me when I was thinking about how do I explain what's going on to my students. It's not enough to just say, we've always had it. Um, I wanted to probe, why has it endured? Yes, it's a form of racism, and we have spent centuries trying to eradicate racism. It's still here, um, so that's part of it. But I also wanted to think about how it is built into our society, our economy, and our politics. So there are so many examples um, when I'm looking at the primary sources for various different anti-immigrant campaigns, and you'll come across these horrible cartoons that show these, um, you know, immigrants as these demonic figures. They're drawn in really char uh, characteristically stereotypical ways. But also I came across um, advertisements, you know, so the anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic party, the Know Nothing Party or the American Party made its own soap. And so there's a, you know, an advertisement for Know Nothing Soap. Um, for it's also very interesting much of the advertisements are for products that are about cleanliness about washing out dirt like you would expel or get rid of immigrants right um, so another wonderful example is um, in 1882 um, a, a laundry soap detergent company is using the Chinese Exclusion Act to explicitly sell its product. So there's a photo of Uncle Sam holding the 
the law this uh, in a scroll and literally kicking the Chinese out of the country and the text is we don't need them anymore because now we have Dixon, Dixon washing soap you know <laughs> um, so xenophobia sells um, today the business of immigrant detention is a multi-billion dollar business um, there's about 50,000 people in detention right now in mostly private run jails um, xenophobia has been part of our democratic process it has motivated mobile, uh, mo motivated and mobilized voters to go to the polls. Um, we've seen this with, with President Trump, but we know that there are many other eras in American history when one anti-immigrant sentiment has been the main party platform and has been extremely effective in getting people to vote. Um, and it's also been part of our international relations. There have been many times when our laws, the U.S. laws, have been praised in other countries. They've been copied by other countries. The uh, most discriminatory immigration laws of the 1920s were actually heralded by Adolf Hitler in the 1930s and seen as a model for Nazi Europe. Um, so this is, this is part of, of how and why this xenophobic tradition continues to be functioning and thriving in America, even as we see some racial progress. There was uh, the president, uh, FDR, who said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Uh -huh. but, but is that at the heart of this? Is it fear? Is that what you're selling? You're selling fear. You need to vote for me because it's scary out there and these people make it scary? Or is it hatred? Or is it a combination? It's a combination. And one of the things that um, I do emphasize in the book and then that what became extremely clear is that this is obviously not just a Trump um, message, that he was in fact building upon an undercurrent, another message of fear and hatred of immigrants that was existing um, certainly in the Republican Party, um, also in more extreme versions on the far right. but but accepted to a large degree by Democrats as well. Recent U.S. anti-immigrant policies have only strengthened the activism against deportations, bans, and the dismantling of an Obama-era program which gave temporary legal protection to immigrants who came to the U.S. as children. I realize that the United States is still a work in progress, that certainly there is this tradition of xenophobia, but that there has always been a, another tradition of challenging some of these worse uh, racist policies. And as a historian, I do feel like we're at a, a, a tipping point, a moment where there has been a much more organized and also broad-based um, challenge to these U.S. immigration policies than there has ever been in the past. So, for example, we knew that when um, Japanese Americans were being forced out of their homes and um, put into incarceration camps, um, that most Americans didn't speak out against those policies. But if you fast forward to 2019, when news came out of the family separation policies, uh, we saw on the streets a broad coalition of, of groups. There were suburban moms. There were um, the folks who had been organizing against the Muslim ban. There were uh, Latino Americans um, whose families were being directly affected by those policies. There were Asian Americans. There were folks from the suburbs as well as from the cities. Um, and I think that that's a sign of hope um, that People understand that these policies are affecting our neighbors, our um, fellow Americans, our um, community members, and that it's not just about immigration, it's also about what kind of America do we want to have and what kind of America do we want to live in. How does America heal? How does it move on from this? Or will this always be a part of our story? I have the sense that it will always be a part of our story, but it doesn't have to be at such an extreme um, part of the story. It doesn't have, we don't have to 
go to such an extreme of demonizing immigrants. We will always have immigration regulation. We will also always have debates over what makes a good immigrant and what makes a bad immigrant. Well, we will always need to make choices in terms of whether we admit people due to family reunification or professional skills or offer pathways to citizenship. But we don't have to use such loaded and racist rhetoric to demonize entire groups of people, to um, rally the, the mobs in such a violent, um, hateful way. That's the hope that when there is a change in leadership and some changes in policy, it's not just going to be about reversing um, the policies that this administration has put into place, but also having a much more honest and broad-based conversation about immigration and about why people move in the first place and what is the United States' role in a global um, world in which migration is only growing. The numbers of displaced people is, is, is at its highest levels um, past World War II. So this is, it's a question for us as a country, but it's also a question for us as a, as a global society that we reconnect and we think about not only our immigration history, but also the future of migration and the United States. The book is called America for Americans. Erica Lee, thanks so much. Thank you.